stretch your legs, you can stand. 346. It won't be very long till this short life shall end. It won't be very long till Jesus shall descend. And then the dead in Christ from bed the place shall rise to meet the Lord and King up yonder in the sky. It won't be very long. It won't Sing the Savior's praise Where saints are never old It won't be very long It won't be very long Till Jesus shall appear That day is drawing near Will you be ready then To meet the ransom throne Get ready for that day This evening, I've got a strange request. I don't know how often you've had your picture made, but uh, my cohort in India wants a picture of the congregation that was here. I'm always getting pictures of those who assemble there in India, so he wants a picture of all the faces here in West Virginia. So we're going to, that's a simple request, so we're glad to feel that one. So. If, if you didn't want your picture made, sorry. <laughs> and if you're sitting with somebody you shouldn't be, <laughs> you shouldn't be. <laughs> We're going to continue our series of lessons this evening. Uh, if you would 
like, you can begin by opening your Bibles to uh, the book of Ephesians. We're going to be uh, looking and bouncing back and forth uh, with some other scriptures and ideas from uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5 this evening. Last night, we started by talking about the very premise that the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The problem has always been sin with mankind. Now, it may have many different names, but that simple little three-letter word sin is the problem. It is at the very heart of most of the world's problems, uh, whether that be sickness, we mentioned earlier in the announcement, some of those who are sick, it may not necessarily be that they uh, brought that on them, but people get sick because of sin. Uh, God told them in the garden, the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And we've been dying surely ever since. Amen. And that's going to continue until Jesus comes again. As we uh, sang in the song, you know, the hope of the child of God is it won't be very long. It won't be very long that we can take off this, uh, this uh, body of flesh and exchange it for a body likened unto our Lord's glorious body. When it comes to the subject matter of sin, Paul tells us in Romans 3 verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. So the message of the hour does not exclude you. There is none righteous. Verse 23 says, For all, A-L-L, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So again, we're not exempt. But the glory in all of that is Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God. Within the pages of the New Testament uh, is the unfolding of God's system of righteousness to redeem us from the sin that we find beginning there in the garden so long ago. Tonight, as I assume most of us who are hearing the lesson are a part of the body of Christ. Some, uh, we hope, who are hearing this uh, are not. We hope that some, as we said last night, who are not a part of the body of Christ will listen to these lessons. If not here tonight, uh, we hope that uh, your recording that you're doing will be there. And I'm, uh, I don't think I announced it last night, but... Uh, we are videotaping these. We're going to add two more lessons. So we have five, and we'll have Revival 2022 that will go into all the world. We will put it on our international uh, web, and it will go literally around the world. We are going around the world. And uh, we're also using these videos. If you're not aware, we're using some of these Revival videos, especially uh, in groups of five and it's there on our web page uh, that you can send people to who are not members of the church and they can follow the five lessons. We already have five up, but we're going to add some more to that. But the whole point, the whole purpose of all of this is to get the people of God to be the people of God and get those who have yet to renounce sin and Satan to repent and Turn to God before it's everlastingly too late. The message tonight might be titled rather simply, As. A-S. I'm going to put that in quotation marks even. That's a little word. That's even smaller than the three-letter word sin. But I find that that little two-letter word as gets us into problems with the three-letter word, which is sin. So again, theologians many times like to use what I call the $50 words. And they want to talk in terms that, again, lose most people. 
But the reality is there is a simplicity which is in Christ that we ought to understand and share. God didn't try to cloak His Word in big, heavy thoughts, but in a very simple doctrine that says, all have sinned. Jesus died for those sins. Repent of your sins. Believe the Gospel. Obey. And you can be saved. Tonight as we kick this off, we want to read from Ephesians the fourth chapter as the Apostle Paul addresses the church there. And I remind you, he is addressing the church first of all and foremost. He says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And that's where we get the title of the lesson tonight, A.S. All the way back in Genesis 3, the devil came to Eve and said, Yea, if God not said that you may eat of all the trees of the garden. And she acknowledged that God would allow them to eat of all the trees except the one of the knowledge of good and evil. They weren't supposed to eat of that because in the day they ate thereof, they would die. And Satan says, you won't surely die. But God knows in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. From the very beginning, that little two-letter word, A-S, is the problem with S-I-N. We can't be happy with where God puts us. We can't be happy with what God gives us. We just want to be as everybody else. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And so they didn't want the women that were a part of them, but they wanted the same kind of women as the sons of men had. And so they forsook the way of God and they embraced the things of the world. And it's not long before we find in Genesis 6 that it repented God for He had made man to dwell on the face of the earth. If you want to know what that little two-letter word A-S and the little three-letter word S-I-N does, it causes God to wish that He had done things differently. You know, when you read in the Scriptures that it repents God of something He's done, you better read that two or three times because the Bible doesn't speak lightly or often of God repenting of the things that He has done. Later on, the nation of Israel came to Samuel and uh, they wanted to have a king just as the other nations. And it troubled Samuel. And in speaking to God, God says, they have not rejected you but they have rejected me that I should be king over them. That's a pretty powerful thing. <clears throat> we want to be the same as the other nations. And as we look at this tonight and as we bring it up to date, the church wants to be as the world. Christianity in general, you can't tell the difference between it and the world. I don't know why anybody in the world would want to be a Christian as the world calls it. Yeah. I mean, what purpose does it serve? There's nothing wrong. I mean, look at the religious world today. Yeah. Everything that you can imagine, all those lists that we have in the Scriptures, the works of the flesh, which are manifest, which are these. Paul says, they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of that shall not. 
It doesn't say maybe, but shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you know there's churches out there, every one of those things on that list is okay. You want to dance and party? It's okay. The Bible calls it reveling, but it's okay. You know, you want to, you love each other and you want to live together? Oh, it's okay. Well, at least they, they, they love each other. Now, again, they call it loving each other. The Bible calls it fornication. And sometimes they're loving each other and they belong to somebody else. And then the Bible calls that adultery, homosexuality. Everything that's in those lists that we read in the script, there's nothing wrong. Why? Because Christianity as a whole, rather than influencing the world, has been influenced by the world. Amen. Amen. Instead of preaching the truth of the gospel of Christ and living that, it's caused problems. AS takes us to SIN, and again, that's defined in many different ways. Matter of fact, in the book of Romans, the first chapter, it says, that eventually, again, uh, after the flood especially, uh, people did not like to even retain God in their memory. That's right. You know, they lived as if there was no God or they at least changed the incorruptible God into the image of corruptible things. And they worshipped and served the creation or the creature the created more than the one who created them. And so today we find the same thing. People live for the flesh. And living for the flesh is sin. And trying to live as the world is sin and it's destroying the church. An example that played out not too long ago, and many of you may know it, there was in Parkersburg for several years, several decades, a Church of Christ school called Ohio Valley College. If you're not aware, it doesn't exist anymore. The story of Ohio Valley College is the story of the churches of Christ today. And it is the story as. When in the 50s and 60s, when the church was still, you know, right on the word, people in this area were troubled that there was nowhere for their sons and daughters to go to school that was Bible based, that would uphold their values without having to send them into. Texas or Tennessee. And so after many years of planning, they opened Ohio Valley College. First it was a two-year, then it went to four-year. And it went from Ohio Valley College to Ohio Valley <coughs> University. And it looked as if things were going well on the outside. But on the inside that little two-letter word, as, kept coming up. What happened? Why did it close? Members of the body of Christ stopped sending as many of their children to Ohio Valley College because they wanted their children to have the same education as their friends and neighbors. They wanted to send them to West Virginia University. They wanted to send them to Marshall University. They wanted to send them to Kentucky and Ohio and several of those places. And so in the process of time, as more and more of the people of God sent their children to secular universities, they had to start recruiting in a bigger area. And so that meant bringing more people from the world to Ohio Valley College who knew very little about the Church of Christ. It was just 
a college that was close to home. And in the course of time, things change because they had to cater now to those of the world and still try to cater to the things of God. And in the course of time, they became irrelevant. Because when you try to be the same as the world, you become the world. Amen. And when you know, we have people in the church that believes that if the church doesn't change, we're not going to get people in. Friends, if the church changes, all we are is becoming the world. Instead of the church influencing the world with the Gospel of Christ, the church is being influenced. And the church is being influenced by the things we're involved in, what our children are involved in. You know, when I grew up, if you were a member of the body of Christ and you had kids in school, you know, if they wanted to play basketball or be in a band or whatever, you know, you need to understand that they're going to be right here on Wednesday night and Sunday. They're not going to be at the football games, soccer games, competitions, or whatever else. And in the course of time, we wanted to be as everybody else. You know, Junior's just so great, he's going to be an NBA star. So we, we let him skip church so that he could become that global success with his own tennis shoes that we somehow imagined those millions of dollars. Well, you know, Junior's, you know, not doing so good today. And the church has changed. Sadly, sometimes people, uh, and again, we, I will be in a funeral home at a funeral and I'm just speechless at some of the clothes that people wear to funerals. Some of them look like they're going to prom. Some of them look like they forgot their skirt. And it's really embarrassing when they decide to reach down and pick something up. You know, as gets us into trouble. And as we mentioned last night, Jesus took in uh, speaking to the people of His day from Isaiah saying, these people's heart is wax gross. It's fat. It's hard. It's thick. I like that, thick. It's, they're not thick here. They're thick here. And sadly, many of the people in the, in the body of Christ are thick up here. And as we mentioned, Stephen say, Sadly, some of our own people are becoming very stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart. They believe that uh, they can live in the world and do as they please, and it doesn't matter. Heard an interesting statement. You probably heard it, but you know, over the years, as as a minister, you know, I've heard people say, you know, well. You know, I know my son or my daughter, they're marrying somebody and they're not in the church, but, you know, I think they can change them and, and, you know, they have a lot of influence. Sadly, I don't think I've ever seen that. It happens, I suppose. I just haven't seen it. You know, I, I see sons and daughters move out of the congregation. Some of them end up in denominational churches. Some of them just quit going to church at all. Families are divided. You know, we, we, we just have so many things that are going on. And Paul tells the church when he wrote to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath light with darkness? You know, and how, how does that work? <clears throat> you know, I mean, how, and, and again, if you marry the child of the devil, you're going to have trouble with your father-in-law. And when the church is, again, 
flirting with the world, it's going to have problems. I think we all know that the church is not growing like it should. And the reason for that is, is people see, I don't know why I need to go to church. Because the world tells them nothing they're doing is wrong. And we have to stand in that gap and say, yes, it is. Yeah. Thus saith the Lord. Yeah. Look at this. They that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so Paul, as he writes to the church at Ephesus, and Ephesus was an interesting city. There was lots of things going on in the city of Ephesus at that time. Idol worship and everything else. And so he says, don't walk as other Gentiles walk in, he says, the vanity of their mind. You know, the... That word vanity there comes from a Hebrew word which means religious error. Error. False religion. What? Walk around with religious views and beliefs that are in essence not correct. Notice verse 18. Having the understanding darkened. Obscured. Last night we read what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. The God of this world hath blinded their hearts. God has blinded a lot of people's hearts. Amen. Paul says it's a shame if the church at Ephesus is one of them. I do believe it's in the book of Revelations that Jesus, or book of Revelation, Jesus writes to the church at Ephesus and says, you know, they have left the first love. Repent and do the first works, lest I come and take your candle out of the way. And we have responsibility there. Uh, understanding darkened, obscured. The world doesn't see things like we do, and they most certainly, because they're so hard-hearted, the soil is so compacted, as we saw last night in the parable of the sower, or the parable of the soils, as sometimes I say, the Word doesn't sink in. But that doesn't change the fact that the understanding that they have, the understanding, not their understanding, the understanding, the body of understandings, the things they understand, the things the colleges teach them, the things their neighbors teach them, the things their friends teach them as they want to be like they are. Their understanding is darkened, being alienated from the life of God. We commented last night that there are literally those in the church that believe if someone has never heard the Gospel, God is going to save them. Baloney. They are alienated. They are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. The word ignorance means the lack of knowledge. The fact that they don't know they're lost doesn't make them saved. No more than not knowing that you have COVID makes you well. You know, we, we've got some people even in our congregation who won't get tested for COVID because they seem to think if you don't get tested, you don't get sick. And we know how that works. Yeah. You know, lots of people don't want to go to the doctor when they start having medical problems because they're afraid they're going to use the C word. And so somehow they think that, you know, if I don't go to the doctor and I don't hear him use the C word, I'll be all right. Again, the Apostle Paul says that many people are alienated from 
uh, the life of God, the life that He has prepared for us, going all the way back to Genesis 3, everybody, most at least, with a very few exceptions from Genesis 3 forward, has not been alienated uh, from God. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. You know, we... We find that. Elijah was faithful to God so much that again, he came and took him. We have a few exemptions on some of that who who walked with God so closely that they were in fellowship. Of course, the Lord Himself was sinlessly perfect. But again, the world doesn't like the term ignorance. And that's because they don't want to acknowledge that there's something they don't know. I'll tell you, a PhD don't make you smart when it comes to the things of God. You may be able to split an atom and you may be able to treat cancer and you may be able to transplant a heart, but that still don't mean you're smart when it comes to the things of God or you're prepared for eternity. Amen. Amen. You know, the Bible doesn't teach you to be a brain surgeon. That's not its reason. But it does show you how to go to heaven. How to undo what A-S and S-I-N has done to us. And he speaks here about the blindness of their heart. And of course, we're not talking about this heart, but we're talking about this, and we're talking about being blinded as the Apostle Paul tells us. Notice verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. You know, the thing about sticking your toe in the, the, in the water of sin is before you know it, you're neck deep and in over your head. Notice the lasciviousness, the sinfulness, the lust is carried out in greediness. When is enough enough? You know, it's, it's, it's never enough when you give yourself over to those things. <laughs> Being past feeling. We have people in the world today who, as the Apostle Paul told Timothy, their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. Yeah. There's nothing they do that's wrong. You know, we, ha- we have people out there that uh, their conscience does not exist. Now thankfully, there's not a lot of them because those people can also be very dangerous. Because those are the people who will do anything at any time to anyone and they can just then go out, go to dinner. They can stab, choke, strangle, cut somebody up in a wood chipper and then go down to McDonald's and have a Big Mac. It just doesn't bother them. Sin keeps increasing. You know, it's in many ways, you know, sin plays on our feelings, our emotions. You know, the devil has learned to manipulate our bodies in the sense that, as Luke tells us, we're drawn away by our own lusts and enticed. Whatever that weakness is. See, the devil watches you. You know, the devil may not be able to read your mind, but the devil knows where you go. The devil knows what you watch on TV. The devil knows what you're doing on the computer. And he knows all your favorite television programs. And He's watched you respond to all of those things. He's very good at studying things. Now Paul says that God will not allow him, 1 Corinthians 10, to tempt you above that which you're able. 
But the devil knows how to use that against you too. He doesn't have to overpower you. He just finds the weakest link. The thing you like the most that you shouldn't be doing at all. And then he manipulates the good feelings, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, whichever avenue he can work his way in there. He's very good at it. After all, he, he was pretty good in the beginning. He got Mother Eve, but that's not his first thing. Jesus said in John 8, speaking about the devil, he was a murderer in the beginning. That is the beginning of this world. The devil didn't come into being after this world was created. When this world was created, he was already a murderer. He had caused a significant portion of heaven's angels to leave their first estate. They had rebelled against God. He had brought the eternal torment and condemnation upon heaven's own, himself and others. So by the time he got down to Mother Eve, he was already pretty good at it. I mean, if you can lead a rebellion against God as an angel, you're, you're you know, that's. You know, I don't know how you expect to win in that game, but again, that's not for me to decide. But people think, I can, I, can, can, I can handle this. And again, we're getting darker and darker and darker and darker. You know, when I was a teenager, you know, the thing was about whether or not we should dance, whether Christians should go to dances. And most congregations, uh, you know, the, the membership would not allow their children to go to school dances and those things because they understood that it leads to lust and to things that shouldn't be going on. And that was things of the world, not things of the church. But today we find people, uh, again, from the churches, they're just, it doesn't matter. And it's kind of shocking over the, the years to see the number of our own young ladies who are pregnant before they get out of high school. Not in the world, but in the church. And I think we know how that happens. And God calls it fornication. You know, you can justify it any way you want, but it's, it's fornication. And again, there's just so many other things. We, you know, again, used to have higher standards for the people of God. The world has influenced us as well as it has influenced the world. And that's why Paul was telling those at Ephesus who was being influenced by those still in the world there, again, do not walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding dark and alienated uh, from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Go over to the fifth chapter and we'll kind of compare what Paul says in verse 15. By beginning verse 15, he says, See then. Now, he has a lot of stuff to say in between, and I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to, to go back and read some of that. I'm sure you all probably don't want to be here at midnight. I'm not Paul. I can preach till midnight, though. An elder once told me that I could do a six week series on Jesus wept. So. <laughs> and I had to prove he was right. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. <clears throat> circumspectly means diligently. Circum comes from the word that means a circle going around. And so what Paul is saying is there is the gospel. It's there. Nothing more, nothing less. It just is. Take the Gospel and stay inside. Amen. Draw a circle around the Gospel 
and stay in there. Don't be a fool. Don't try to stick your big toe out and test something. Don't look where you shouldn't look. Don't go where you shouldn't go. Guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. That's what wise Solomon said. Notice that Paul says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. For most people, we've been fools long enough. I know we don't like that word and it insults people. But again, a fool's a fool. And if you don't understand what it means to be one, then again, maybe you know, the shoe fits. You know, we, we need to quit pretending and acting like we're not going to be judged by what's in this book. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Don't be a fool. You can't out-talk Jesus. How do I know that? Because some of the brightest minds that the Jewish leaders could come up with tried to trip Jesus up and He made them fools. Amen. Should we render taxes to Caesar? You know, they thought they were going to cause a big division and a big fuss. Jesus said, let me see it. Whose face is on it? They said, Caesar's. He says, well, if it's got Caesar's face on it and Caesar wants it back, give it to him. But give to God the things that are God's. Mm -hmm. Then they come up with this big scenario, and I'm not going to go into it, about the woman who had been married so many times and her husband's had died. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? He says, you do her. Not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. In a resurrection, they neither marry or given in marriage, but they're the, as the angels in heaven. <clears throat> you do her. And basically, without saying, he says a foolish question. And you don't understand the Scriptures either. We had had a hurt because those questions came from the Sanhedrin. The biggest and the brightest and the most educated Israel had to offer. Gamaliel, who was a doctor of the law, was sitting in in the midst of all that. He was a doctor of the law. He had his PhD. And Jesus says, you do err, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. <clears throat> What's the greatest commandment? Now, again, the Jews traditionally say there's 613 commandments in the Old Testament. There's 365 commandments that say thou shalt not. There's 248 that say thou shalt. And so they figured no matter which one he picked, they would get a fight. And Jesus says, you know, the number one commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind. Seconds like unto it, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two, not just one, but on these two, hang the Law and the Prophets. The other so-called 611, uh, they're just hanging on these two. <clears throat> and so, again, Paul tells the church, you know, the, the New Testament's not that big. It really isn't. I mean, you can read it and read it and read. It. I mean, you, you know, we, uh, you know, we uh, did a thing at Hamlin when I was there. We read a New Testament all the way through every month for twelve months. You can read the entire New Testament a little bit every day, and you can read the whole thing in a month. You can read it twelve times in a year with about thirty minutes a day. So it's not that hard to figure out what it says and therefore it shouldn't be that hard to walk circumspectly and not say, well, I didn't know that. Go through West Hamlin and tell the nice policeman down there you didn't know it was 25 mile an hour. <laughs> I see you've been through there, right? <laughs> 
And I worked at the post office at Branchland. One of our delivery people who came there and dropped stuff off, he wanted to figure out, he asked me, how can I get here without going through West Ham? But again, ignorance of the law is no excuse. We're supposed to walk circumspectly and we're still going to be judged by the things that are written in that book. There's nothing that's going to be thrown out there that we haven't had a chance to know and to hear and to understand and study and apply. And we can do it all because there's nothing in there that you know, is, is too hard. You know, how we live our life individually is governed by the things of this book. How we order and, and, and follow our family, the, the family structure is ordered in the Scriptures. I mean, we know what the Bible teaches. Sometimes we just don't like to listen to it. But the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And, and again, both the husband and the wife have a responsibility to teach and bring up the children. She's supposed to order the house, that is to keep it running in the way that it ought to be. The children and all of those. Again, our relationships to those outside are also governed by the Scriptures. It tells us, you know, it tells us it calls some people masters, but that would be bosses. And it also talks about some servants, and that would be employees. And so we know about work relationships between masters and employees. Those are addressed in there. We know about neighbors because uh, our relationship with the neighbors should be to love the neighbor as thyself. And to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Again, our religious fellowship as far as who we should call brother and sister, uh, who is a child of God, who is a Christian. Those things are clearly spelled out in the Scriptures. Amen. And you can hijack the name Christian if you want to, but hijacking something don't make it your own. You know, in the news several years ago, and again back in the 60s, it was a common thing for somebody to walk into the cabin of a jet and hijack it. But I got news for them, they still don't own the plane. You know, because you put a gun in somebody's face at a convenience store, doesn't mean you own the money, it's in the cash register. Hijacking things, stealing things, again, do not make the relationship, fellowship, and worship of the body of Christ is all spelled out so that we can walk circumspectly, that our worship needs not be foolish. Amen. You know, some people want to be foolish in their worship. They want to talk gobbledygook and call that tongues. And again, they have no idea what the word tongues even means. You know, if you want to speak in tongues, that's fine. Speak in English, that's a tongue. You know, you can speak in the language that people understand. Gobbledygook is not tongues. Tongues are understandable, they're translatable. Rolling in the aisles, hand clapping, dancing. You know, sometimes I am. I'm distressed when I see some of the things that even in the body of Christ uh, is done. But again, Paul gives us an opportunity. Do we want to walk as other Gentiles walk, as the nations, as the world walks, or do we want to walk as the people of God? Amen. <coughs> You know, when we stand before Jesus on the day of judgment and the books are opened, the scrolls, these 66 books, wherever we've lived and whatever dispensation of time, when the books are opened and the dead are judged out of the things which are written in this book, you know, do you want to be with the sheep and goats? <coughs> Do you want to be those that Jesus says, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Faithfulness is based on what this book says. Or do you want Him to say, depart from me, I never knew you. 
Well, Lord, Lord, we've done all kinds of wonderful things in Your name. You may have done it in my name, but I still don't know who you are because we never met here. You may have tried to hijack my name and you may have tried to hijack the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, but I don't know who you are. A man doesn't run a race unless he runs it lawfully. And that's the law. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, then you need to carefully consider do you want the judgment and the punishment as the world will receive it? 2 Thessalonians 1 says that our Lord will be revealed in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that one, know not God, and two, obey not the Gospel of Christ. And these shall be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from glorious power. But Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that the Lord will descend. The dead in Christ shall rise first. They will meet Him in the air. And so shall they ever be with the Lord. Who do you want to be as? Do you want to be as those who know not God, who obey not the Gospel? Or do you want to be as those of Enoch who is translated that they should not see death? So Enoch is a type of the transfiguration and change that will take place when Jesus comes again. Enoch was not. God took him. He was here one minute, gone the next. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trump. It's going to be fast. You don't get to make up your mind when the trump trump blows. It's all over. If you're here tonight, a child of God, but again, you're trying to live as the world and as the church. Those two are not compatible. Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth the broad. You either are or you aren't. If you're here tonight in any way subject to the invitation, we encourage you to come as to what we sing. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.